Good morning. How's everybody this morning? Are you doing good? Okay, I have to tell you, I was just bawling my eyes out during worship. I know James left already. But I, I, I want to read the beginning. Oh, do I read them now? Okay, so that, the song, The Goodness of God. All my life he has been faithful. All my life he has been so, so good. And today as we go through these spiritual blessings of God, he's going to shower us more with the goodness of his word. And literally I was just crying. And then it said, um, you led me through the fire. I can tell you that this passage took me through the fire. Not that the passage itself, the, the, um, it's beautiful, it's good, but to, I still do have not wrapped my, my head around all of it. So we're going we're gonna to kind of get started, and I say kind of. My feeling is I have a ton of notes, and now I'm wondering, okay, God, what do you want to do with them? <laughs> so let's, let's, let's see. Um, all right, so I have a question for you. Have you recovered from the holidays? Yes? No? Is it funny that we use the word recovered as if we've been in some bad accident or something? <laughs> like, oh my gosh, what happened in the holidays that makes us feel like we have to be recovered? Although, I am slightly recovering from an accident. I was just walking. I wish I had some great story to tell. And I tripped on the flagstone of our sidewalk. And I ripped up my arm in gashes, like mm, about 23 stitches <laughs> right here. Do you know what I learned from that? It's recovering from that is when you're not young, falling is just not good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I watch, my, I watch my grandson tumble and roll, and I'm like, mm. now when I like walk upstairs, I'm just, just watching. So I understand that recovering, but I do find it funny that we say, are, have you recovered from the holidays? As if it was a bad thing. Um, oh, and then this morning, just I was reading some little clip um, in, a, in an email that I got, and they have a new thing, and <laughs> they're called wearable airbags. <laughs> to prevent elderly, to help elderly when they fall. And I'm like, oh, please. <laughs> I'd really like to see how they work, you know? <laughs> okay, so back to the holidays. Isn't it crazy to think that we get to celebrate the king of the universe, the savior of the world's birthday? And not only that, much of the world, at least think of Christmas, they don't know what they're celebrating. But we get to celebrate his birth. That in itself is just, um, is just amazing to me. It is Jesus, the most beautiful gift given to us. And I know Christmas was a few weeks ago, but I, it, it's still hanging on. And this passage made me think of it. And then, and then I even put down here in my notes, he's such a good, good father. And then we sang it, that he's a good, good father. So here's a question for you. How many of you love to give gifts? You want to find the perfect gift. Yeah. How many of you like to receive gifts? Yeah, of course. We all like to receive gifts, right? But you go looking for the perfect gift, that thing that that person is going to need or love, something that is making them so happy. Like um, as, as a parent or as parents, we love to get our kids gifts, whether it's Christmas or their birthday, something that they are going to absolutely love. That's something that makes them squeal with joy when they open it. Hmm. How many of you remember a gift that you received that made you, that has made you squeal with joy? Whether you were a kid, 
at Christmas, something that made you all excited? Can you think of one in your head that comes to your mind? Pastor Chris, during his Christmas series, um, put up a, a slide of his favorite gift, which was a Schwinn Stingray bicycle. That was my gift also. So cool, banana seat. And I had streamers coming from, from my handlebars. And then he also talked about Hot Wheels. You remember Hot Wheels? I remember getting Hot Wheels. And he, do you remember what he said about Hot Wheels? Uh, yeah? He talked about how it's amazing, those Hot Wheel tracks, how mom found other uses for them. <laughs> yeah. And only once, there we go. Grandma Johnson said only once. And I have to say, my mom had one only once. She was trying to help remind my sister and I to quit arguing. It worked. At least for that moment, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so even Pastor Chris brought those up, those things that, uh, that's, these things that made you squeal, those things that bring you so much delight. But many of the gifts that we get, they are going to wear out, right? I mean, I don't have the Schwinn Stingray bicycle anymore. No streamers. Maybe I should get that for like the bicycle, you know, those streamers. Um, sometimes they even become obsolete. How many of you remember this? Okay, if you remember this, that means you're, you're dated with me. Sorry, we're dating ourselves with that. Yeah, the cassette Walkman. And then, oh, then the next one, the CD, oh, the CD Walkman. <laughs> was so, so cool. And then the next one, it moved on. Oh, we, we had the, um, the iPod, the first generation, and then the other 20, oh, there's the first generation, yeah? And then the other 20 generations of the iPod. Now, what, now we just stream whatever we want from whatever source to whatever device we have our phones, our TVs, whatever. We just stream the music in. We no longer, it's, it's obsolete. Those things are obsolete. The cool, I can't live without it, that we needed the next one of, which would be like the new updated phone or whatever, um, they wear out. They become obsolete. So today's passage is full of heavenly blessings. And if you look at your, if you look at your um, note page that's right there, um, that, that uh, where it's given out, it's kind of a note page. I'm sorry, you know me. I'm not very good at the note pages, but okay. Um, these blessings, they never wear out. They never become obsolete. And the giver of these blessings, the giver of these gifts is the all-powerful, all-knowing, sovereign creator of the cosmos, our heavenly father. He knows exactly what we need. And not just need, but something that would cause us to squeal with joy. So today we're going to go, we're going to look through these different gifts and these blessings and we're going to unwrap these gifts, these blessings through this passage in Ephesians. So uh, we're going to be looking at Ephesians 1, 3 through, 3 through 10, but 3 through 14 is one sentence in the Greek, one sentence. And in the Greek, there's no commas, nothing. It's just one sentence. And even in English, it gets kind of jumbled up. It has 257 words. It's like the same length as the Gettysburg Address. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so when I, uh, it's so rich and deep with meaning that dark, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones spent six months teaching this section. We get 30 minutes, no worries, 30 minutes. And John MacArthur says, it's like unpacking a semi of theology. 
So you, as somebody that's getting ready to teach you, you're reading these commentaries, you're like, oh, Lord Jesus. I, I was not going to teach this. This wasn't, I wasn't scheduled to teach this. Um, Kathy Clark was scheduled to teach this. But my daughter's getting ready to have a baby, and I was going to teach about the time she had the baby. So I knew I needed to do some changing. And Kathy said, well, I'll change with you. I didn't look at what I was changing her for. I'm like, Kathy, come on. I'm sure you were ready to teach. Come on up. Do it. <laughs> you <laughs> So all of that to say is, yikes, I am not a theologian. I'm just a girl who loves Jesus, wants to love him more, wants to know God more. Chris last week used the phrase, I am a beggar helping other beggars find some bread. So today, let's see what, um, let's see what kind of bread God has for us um, today. Father, um, I come today and I stand, you know, through the, through the wonderful time and tears spent over this. I'm humbled. And I think, who am I, God, to teach your word? I, I, I don't know. I am truly not a theologian. I am a beggar. Just trying to find some bread to give to other people. And so I invite you, God, I am begging that you would come today and that you'd feed your girls through this beautiful passage. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way. Uh, I pray, God, that um, I just, I want to empty myself, that you would flow through me today, Lord. I love you so much. We love you so much. And we welcome you today to teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so you're going to need your Bibles, whether it's your Bibles, whether it's the um, pages that were printed out, you know, that you could circle, study through, your phones, whatever you use, you need to, because uh, there's a lot of different things that are happening in there, okay? And we're going to, you need to look at it. I want you to see it. I will at times jump and use the New Living Translation because to be honest, there was sometimes I'm like, I, I have no idea what he's talking about here. And I needed to bring it into some language that helped me understand. So I, I did use this. So let's read this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons or daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Wow. Wow. I, I don't know. I don't know. Even as I read it again, I think, oh, my goodness. It is a beautiful passage. M MacArthur did describe it as um, like unpacking or unloading a, a semi of theology. But listen to the way that some others have described it. It's not quite as scary when you listen to these, these other ways. Uh, Gigi Finley says, we enter this epistle through a magnificent gateway. It is as though a doorway is open into heaven. Ah, much better than a semi of theology. John McKay said, it's a rhapsodic adoration. This rhapsodic adoration is comparable to an overture of an opera. Ooh. This whole passage is a poem of praise. 
we receive the gifts that are in it, but truly this whole passage is praising God in Christ for all that he has done. And I think if we wrap our head around that in the beginning, it will help us kind of wade through all the beautiful things that are in it. I'm, I'm going to read the beginning of um, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Hmm. Sounds like a familiar phrase today. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet. I'm going to stop right there because um, this is what, what Paul opens with. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God, our Father. Blessed. And so I looked like, what does this blessed mean? Because blessed and blessing, and is, oh, there's a lot of that going on here. Hanley Molay wrote that the idea behind blessed is praised with worshiping love. Praised with worshiping love. Paul is so excited, so overjoyed. He begins with praising God with worshiping love for the blessing, for blessing us with every conceivable spiritual blessing. He sets the tone. It's a poem, a melodious sonnet he's starting off with. Martin Lloyd-Jones uses the phrase gushing out praise. Oh, I like it. So I kind of joined them together, and I put out gushing out worshiping love. Gushing out worshiping love. So as we start, we bless you, God. We gush out worshiping love to you because of all of this that's in this section. In advance, we do that. And then it says, who has blessed us? So if you look, it says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Now I'm going to take a little tangent here. The word blessed has the thought of happiness and joy. God is into blessing his people. He loves it. That is, the, is his heart for his creation. It brings him joy to, to bless us. And we find him blessing throughout the word. Throughout the word, we find him blessing his creation, blessing his kids. Where is the first place that we hear God blessing? Giving, speaking blessing. In the Bible. I heard you say Genesis, Genesis 1, He starts, very first chapter of the Bible. He says, and God blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. He says, have kids, fill the earth, enjoy my creation. He speaks blessing over them from the very beginning. But what happened? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Things went south in Eden. <laughs> and sin entered into the picture. And then the earth was filled with violence. And humanity looked doomed forever. That's a sad place after everything he just said. But God is about blessing his people for a plan that he has, and we'll hear about that plan. Ultimately, he blesses us according to his purposes. According to his purposes. And he says, then he blesses again, and he chooses Abraham in Genesis 12, 2, and he says, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Do you catch a glimpse of what his plan is? Do you see it coming? Things are a mess. God says, it's okay. I have a plan. I'm sovereign. This doesn't surprise me at all. 
So how are all the families of the earth going to be blessed because of Abraham? I mean, if you've read the Old Testament, it really doesn't look good through the whole thing. Little blips of great things, but not very many. It's all pointing to what? Jesus. And Jesus shows up in the genealogy of Abraham. God says, I am going to bless all humanity. I'm going to bless all the families of the earth through Jesus. So all the way back there, we never have to worry about losing hope. No matter what's going on, God's got it. And I'm sure they didn't, under, they didn't understand this, right? Back in the Old Testament, they were hoping for the Messiah. We're waiting for the return of Christ. But he says, don't just wait. I've got this. Be a part of what I'm doing. I am redeeming humanity. Even now, I'm redeeming. And you get to be a part of it. I I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless, I will bless you so you will be a blessing. Whoa. I love it. I love this. So God's plan has been always to redeem humanity. And he does it through Christ. And now the next part says, in Christ. All of these blessings that we're going to unwrap today are ours in Christ, because of Christ, through Christ. This is what I want you to do. I want you to quickly look. If you have the paper that uh, has all the, um, where you can circle or your Bible or whatever, I want you to quickly see how many times you can find in Christ or in him, in the beloved, in referring to Christ. Quickly look. And you only have to go through 10 because there is more a little later. But just through 10. Look and see what you can find. What have you got? Six. Six. Yeah, six. I'm sorry, I'm going to do something real quick here. Here, I tell you to have you get your Bibles out, and then I forgot to bring mine. Um, six. Um, the phrase in Christ is repeated six times. In one, in verses three and nine, in the beloved, verse six, in him, in four, seven, and 10. It's important that we see that everything that we're going to be looking at today is in Christ. It's not in us. It's not because of us. It's in him and because of him. All the blessings, everything that's going to happen. Keep that in mind. Super important. So let's look at the verse again who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Specific type of blessing. Not natural. Not Sony Walkmans. Not iPhones. Spiritual. Spiritual blessings. He has blessed us with every blessing of the Spirit. Whoa. Blessings that pertain to our life in the spirit. So all the blessings that we receive from God are of the spirit. These are spiritual blessings. Important to hang on to because they're not natural. They're not. Helps us understand also why they will never be of um, wear out or become obsolete. They're of the spirit. No spiritual blessing has been withheld from us if we are in Christ. We have every spiritual blessing. In the Old Testament, the blessings like in Deuteronomy 28, where blessings for their obedience was good harvest, many children, abundance of livestock. Those are great blessings. Ultimately, they did run out. But the blessings of the New Testament are spiritual. And in the heaven and in the heavenlies, they're spiritual. The blessings we will look at here are not based on what we do or don't do, but whose we are. Whose we are. 
in advance. We have done nothing to earn any of these blessings. Nothing. The only thing that uh, allows us, puts us in a place to receive the blessings is that we belong to Christ. We're in him. So let's look at the first, um, the first thing on your outline. I know this sounds really bad, but do you have an extra one? I've dropped mine. Thanks. This is the reality of who I am. What? What'd you say, Heather? Go ahead. <laughs> who, me? <laughs> Okay, so God is the source of all blessings. We're blessed in Christ. These are spiritual blessings. And the first blessing that's pointed here that we're going to unwrap a little bit is chosen and predestined. In verse 1, 4, it says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. I really like the way the New Living Translation says, even before he made the world... God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. This is really bad. Um, a pastor whose name I didn't write down. I'm sorry, he doesn't get credit for this beautiful thing. I, I forgot. Um, he says this. Is there a slide for this one? Maybe? Okay, I'll read it. In the mysterious mists of eternity... God graciously chose to make those who didn't even yet exist God's own children through the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. Though God knew that we would be unholy and blameworthy, God chose to make us holy and blameless. I mean, isn't that kind of crazy to think that before the foundation of the world, before creation, before time began as we know it, he loved us? He chose us to know him, how? Through Jesus. Through Jesus. There it is again. That's the gospel. That's the whole, that's the good news. That's the gospel right there. To know him, to know him. Um, I was at Chris's house doing some studying where it was quiet. I love, I have my family is living with me right now. They're missionaries and they're on home assignment. I love it. And I have a three-year-old toddler whom I adore. He's not quiet at our house. <laughs> so I, Chris graciously opened up her <laughs> office for me. And she had a book by J. Vernon McGee sitting there. I want to go back and get that book and just read. As a matter of fact, if you want the whole scoop on Ephesians, read that one. Because it's, it's awesome. So I'm going to... I'm going to say it how I think James Vernon McGee would have said it. <laughs> he says, God planned our salvation way back yonder in eternity before you and I were even in the world. Wow. That's awesome to me. We were chosen before we had done anything, good or bad. God says, I want them. I love them. I want them to be my kids. Um, and Ephesians 2.8 says, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's a gift from God. Once again, we have to remember that it's nothing we can do. It's all in Christ. And I think, thank you, Jesus. Praise you, God. I can't do it. I can put that twang in. I can't do it, Lord. And then verse 1, 5, he says, In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Now God takes it a step further. He says, I've chosen you to be made holy and without fault in my eyes because of my son Jesus. Now, because you're, because you are in Christ. I want you to be part of my family. I, in love, I will adopt you. I will make you daughters through Jesus because it brings me so much joy to do so. So God's, 
This plan that he has is not only includes salvation and personal transformation, which, awesome, right? Yes, we need that. But it's also a warm, confident relationship with our, with our Abba, with our Abba Father. He takes it a step further. He goes, ah, come be part of my family. And in Roman law, a person who had been adopted had all the rights of a legitimate son in his new family. He, the law saw him as a new person. Um, and that's, um, that's where Paul's writing from, is, is from that Roman law. So we have every, being adopted, and I, I don't know, I... I have some interesting feelings about that word adopted now because I have an adopted grandson. Um, but when we are, when he says, I want you to be part of my family, I want you to be born again into this family, he says, now you're all my heirs. You have access to everything in Christ. Whoever, whatever Christ is, so are you. We could sit on that one for a little bit. Really, like, whoa. We're his daughters. The creator of the cosmos is our dad. And we get to be his daughters. John, uh, 1 John 3, 1 says, Three, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. In his love. In his love. He's lavished his love on us. Then in, in verse 6, it says, there's, it's kind of like a little interlude. It's like we stop and we praise God for his blessings. And it says, so we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. So he opens up in praise and he's going on, he's opening up some of these gifts and he goes, hey, let's stop. Turn our focus back to praising God for these things. We, for the glorious grace, all of these gifts and blessings that we receive are by his glorious grace to us who belong to his dear son. So then the next two things, the next two packages we're going to unwrap, they kind of go together. Now, in my mind, I, when I read this, I really think that the, it's like redemption and forgiveness. I think forgiveness should come first. Guess it really doesn't matter. But that was my thinking in my head. So the first one is redemption. Let me pull this up. <laughs> Wrong version. <laughs> in him we have redemption through his blood. Through Jesus' blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Oh, there it is again. According to his grace. According to his grace. So in him we have redemption through his blood. And redemption means to liberate by paying a ransom in order to set a person free. Most oftentimes it's used in reference to ransoming slaves. Slaves could be redeemed by someone paying the ransom, paying the price. They then became the property of the one who paid the ransom. <coughs> Redemption here, though, means that they were bought with, you're bought with a price and then set free. Now, I don't know if you've noticed it, but if you look around at all, you can see that humanity is a slave to sin, right? Everywhere we look, we see the effects of the bondage to sin, everywhere. But Christ, through Christ, he redeemed us through his blood. It was his death that paid the ransom for our sin. Jesus came to free us from the slavery and the bondage of the sin. The only thing that makes us any different than when we look out and see the bondage to sin and the slavery to sin in humanity 
is that we've been bought with a price. That is the only thing that makes us any different. I don't know about you, but I've been set free, but I still struggle with sin. Right? Yeah, we're still working that out. Um, John 8, 36 says, so if the son sets you free, do you know the rest? You are free indeed. If the son through his blood has set you free, you are free indeed. Praise God. Praise God. And then it says the forgiveness of sins. Let's unwrap that one a little bit. Forgive, oh, this is something new to me. I, I learned this. Forgiveness means to send away or let go. I never heard of it that way. I don't know which commentary I got it out of, sorry. In Leviticus 16, two goats were chosen to represent the sins of the people. One goat was taken and sacrificed as a sin offering. And the other one, they laid their hands on the goat's head as a representation of sin. And they sent it away into the wilderness. It took the sins of the people away. But it wasn't killed. It was just taken away. That's where we get the word scapegoat. Interesting, huh? Yeah. That's what I thought. Like, whoa, that's pretty cool. Instead of receiving the punishment for our sins, Jesus takes our sins away. He takes them away. He was the atoning sacrifice. He paid the price. He takes them away. We are forgiven. And when God forgives us, he's, he's not saying, yeah, it's okay. What you did is all right. You know, I know everybody sins. He's not condoning it. He doesn't condone it at all. He's not waiting for us to make it right. What he's doing is he is letting it go. Because of the blood of Jesus, he doesn't see it. He lets it go. It makes me think of um, the song from Frozen. Let it go, let it go. And it makes me think, how many times do I hold on to my forgiven, or lack of forgiveness? And God's saying, let it go. Let it go. That's what he does. And I think at this point, because of what we've just heard about redemption and forgiveness, we need another interlude of praise. Of praise. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. I think we just need to stop and go, wow, we praise you. That's more than we can handle. I need to stop and think about this. So on the, on the next um, page, um, in the next one, I made a mistake. Go figure. Um, it should say, instead of, um, instead of lavished his kindness upon us with all wisdom and insight, I should have put according to the riches of his grace that he lavishes on us. It doesn't change it a lot, but a little bit. So according to the riches of his grace that he lavished upon us. We just did that in our little um, uh, interlude of praise. We praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us. Again, according to the riches of his grace that he lavishes upon us. That is a gift. Unwrap that gift. Hang on to that gift. It's constantly there. He's pouring it out on us. Redemption and forgiveness is all according to his overflowing grace to us. He lavishes it upon us. And remember Ephesians 2, 8 and, uh, through 10. It is by grace you have been saved. Not of anything of yourself. So then the next, and then it goes on and it says, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. He reveals to us the mystery of his will. In the New Living Translation, it says, God now has revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to, fill his, to fulfill his own good plan. His own good plan. In his perfect wisdom and insight, God revealed the mystery. The mystery means something that hasn't been known until up to now. Then he, he kind of 
kind of kept it close, keeping his cards close. Now he goes, oh, let me show you this. Something that was not known before this time of his will or plan. God desires also, through his word, he will reveal mysteries that we're unsure of. He goes, here, I have something new for you. Have you ever read the word and you read it? It's great. And you go back and you read it again. It's great. And you go back and read it again. You're like, I never saw that before. Yeah. At that time, God says, ah, oh, let me show you something. The spirit says, ah, oh, let me bring this to light to you. So what's the plan? Number, number six, the plan. At the right time, God will unite all things in heaven and earth in Christ. The NEB translate. What is the NEB? I didn't look that up. It's some translation. Um, in verse 10 says, that the universe might be brought into unity with Christ. At the right time, God will bring all things in heaven and earth in Christ. Another writer uses the phrase, the entire harmony of the universe. Ooh. I really like, um, John Stott sums it this way. In the fullness of time, God's two creations, his whole universe, <laughs> wow, his whole universe, and his whole church, his whole family of God, will be unified under the cosmic Christ, who is the supreme head of both. That is his plan. He has been redeeming humanity from the beginning. And the ultimate goal is to bring it all in, to bring it all in unity, all of it in Christ. What would it look like if all of heaven and earth, just in the physicality, was in unity in Christ? No global warming, no floods, no, you know, earthquakes. The whole body of Christ, his whole church, what will it look like when we are all in unity in Christ? That's like gives me goosebumps. We try. It's really hard. It's really hard. But that's God's plan. And it has been his plan from the beginning, right? When he blessed Adam in the, in the garden. When he blessed Abraham. He says, it's my plan. I am going to bring humanity into Christ. I'm going to unite it all. God's plan is to finally bring all things under the loving rule of Jesus Christ. Our destiny is to finally experience perfect love between God and all of God's children, as well as the rest of creation. One day, Paul promises, God will unite all of God's creation in God's love, unity, peace, and completeness. But there's a reason it's not just so we feel great about it, which we will, so that we can worship the Lord forever in the glory of God's new creation and his redeemed creation. These spiritual blessings are incredible. Once again, they never wear out. They never become obsolete. We didn't pay for them like all those gifts at Christmas. Jesus paid for them all. He paid for them all. I'm sorry, I'm still like, whoa, this is really more than I think my whole being can get a handle on. It's a section that will go on and on and on. And in, in Ephesians, he's going to talk more about the unity the unity of the church, the unity of families. He's going to continue this process, but right now he opens it, up, opens it up and he lays a foundation for it. 
there's um, a slide that, I, that we're going to look like, a quote by Spurgeon. Our thanks are due to God for all temporal blessings. They are more than we deserve. But our thanks ought to go to God in the thunders of hallelujahs for spiritual blessings. A new heart is better than a new coat. To feed on Christ is better than to have the best earthly food. To be an heir of God is better than to be the heir of the greatest nobleman. To have God for our portion is blessed, infinitely more blessed than to own broad acres of land. God has blessed us with spiritual blessings. These are the rarest, the richest, the most enduring of all blessings. They are priceless in value. Mm. Father, we bless you. We gush out worshiping love to you, God. The praise of your glorious grace. You have given us spiritual blessings, redemption, forgiveness, adoption, We praise you, God, and all of this in Christ Jesus, all of this in Jesus. Thank you so much, God. Thank you so much, God. God, help us not to forget Help us not to forget these spiritual blessings. Help us not to grow weary when we see just the ugliness of sin around, knowing that your plan from the beginning, before time, was to redeem all of creation, all of humanity, and bring us all into unity in Christ. That's your plan because of your great love. Your goodness, God, truly is running after us. Thank you, Lord. We love you so much. We give you the rest of this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do you know, I wanted to share one, one more thing. This I made me think about this. <laughs> that all of these spiritual blessings um, are not for everybody. They're only for those who are in Christ. In Christ, we are promised these blessings and so many more. But what if you're not in Christ? What if you're not a follower of Jesus? What if you haven't come into the family of God? I just say, if you have a question about that in your heart, like, I'm not sure, I want that, I would love to talk to you about it. Talk to your table leader, talk to one of other leaders. Uh, Let's, let's talk about it and see what it looks like to be in Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen.